Good morning, everybody. What a great place it is to be this morning. <clears throat> place where we can say it all the time, worship an awesome God, God of glory, God of grace, mercy, God of love. Everything is demonstrated at that cross of Calvary. The God of the universe that existed before creation, before time, that God revealed himself in the flesh and became sin for all of us. And what a great place where we can come and worship the one and true God. Jehovah God of the Old Testament is Christ of the New Testament. What a great place to be. It's good to see everybody out there this morning. We have a prayer list. If you uh, want to receive the prayer list, you can email me at the Good News Voice. I ask that you pray for the people every week. There is power in prayer. Like we learned last week with Elijah. And the power of, you know, the more you read the word of God, you learn the will of God. You can pray for his will to be done. And like I said last week, if we could, Todd reminded me this morning that we wrote down all the prayers that the Lord has answered in life would fill probably books. He's a good God. He's a good God. And I always say this, all he's ever want from me my whole life has been good for me. That's a good God. How can we not fall in love with him? Because he loved us first. Man. We have an offering pod in the back. It's on the wall if you want to share. That's up to you. That's between you and the Lord. And uh, the money's used, as you know, for further the ministries of the gospel of Christ for this place to make upgrades to you know the windows and you can see the upgrades that we've already made and just grateful for the faithful families that continue to give and pray for this place because we are we know that we fight against you know not flesh and blood we fight against a spiritual darkness and when you're clear on the gospel people are going to kind of try to come in and mess that up and the devil would like that to happen but the money is used for the gospel. Nobody takes a wage here. It's all, again, that's, that's about what we can do to help. And you know, I love when, to seeing people tune in that they write on online. You know, we also get people tuning in from you know, Cameroon or Kenya or signing in from Haiti. So if you're signing in, just love that you would sign it in from Calumet, Minnesota, whatever you want. It'd be great to see people when they when they say, you know, tuning in from, I think it was Bangladesh last week, somebody was tuning in from, which is pretty cool that gospel is going around the world. But that's what the money's used for so others can hear, because it's pretty rare for individuals to hear the gospel. You know, they want to talk about, <clears throat> you know, you need to give more money or they need to, about you doing this to get saved. And we speak about Jesus here, because Jesus is. Same today as he was yesterday, as he'll be for tomorrow. It's all about him. Kevin talked about Nate and Jen, some announcements, and then Alex and Miracle's wedding. We just pray that you keep both of those, all four of those individuals in prayer, and I pray for a healthy pregnancy, and then a healthy birth for mom and the baby, and for Jen to have patience, because she will have two babies in January. <laughs> one big one, one little one. <laughs> and Alex and Miracle's wedding in June 24th. We have Bible study Wednesday night, 6 30 to 8. Encourage you to come out. What a good time it is. And uh, it's, it's a great place to ask questions, not be judged, you know, not be, uh, you know, we don't all know everything, but somebody around the table might know the answer. If not, try to use the resources to find it. But Again, a great place to come and have fellowship with other believers and pray for each other and continue to read and apply the Word of God to our lives. We have uh, the first and third Monday of the month for a women's devotion, kind of a you know craft night and devotional night. So I heard it went pretty well, and uh, we'll see how the, you know as it goes. I'm sure it's going to grow and and uh, you know, praying for each other, things like that. So Veterans Day was 11, 11. And what I just want to take a second here because 
This past Friday on 11-11-22, we celebrate our veterans on that date every year. It was the 11th hour of the 11th month, or the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, when World War I ended. It was four brutal years of killing and fighting, we know that. And one year later, America dedicated November 11th as Armistice Day. An armistice is a truce, a truce between two enemies coming together to stop fighting. So I think it's time for us, you know, that we, we thank God and, Remember all the great servicemen and women who kept, who kept our country from evil. I think we forget often that we're standing upon the shoulders of our dads and our grandpas that have gave us this freedom. And we soon sometimes forget that. Wednesday was a little defeating for me after Tuesday's results. But then I showed up to Bible study in Acts chapter 5, we read, But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. So at the end of the day, you know, God's in control. He didn't wake up Wednesday morning and be like, ah, oh, dang. No. We know that the uh, United States is not in the Bible. But I just pray for the opportunities I had as a kid to grow up in the greatest nation in the world, that we could pass that on to our kids and, great, and our grandkids and our great-grandkids, that they have the same opportunity that we had. And it's because of men and women that have given their lives and their time for our country. I also want to remember Christ on Veterans Day because he fought the good fight too. Christ died on the cross for our sins, for all mankind. He's buried and resurrected from the grave. And he did this for me and he did this for you. I believe he did that. I believe he died for your debt of sins and resurrected for you. Man, you're going to heaven forever. But we need to remember freedom is not free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Someone had to pray the price for us to be able to be here today. The gospel is outlawed in 51 countries in the world today. You cannot carry a Bible. I had a friend in the Philippines. When I was in the Philippines, he was going to Vietnam. And he was going to, you know, that's those countries in the Southeast Asia area. Laos and uh, some other countries there. And he had to smuggle a Bible in. It was illegal to bring a Bible into those, some of those countries. He had to smuggle heaven tracks, a risk just to take them across the border. And there's so many that want to give that up. And I tell you what, I look at this verse here as for our servicemen and women and for Christ. There's greater love than hath no man than this, than a man, than a man lay down his life for his friends. So I would just say, if, you got a, if you're a veteran, just like you to stand up for a second. If you're a veteran, please stand up. Ronnie, Todd, let's just, let's just say thank you to these guys. Thank you. Today's message is all about, we're going to move to Hebrews. We're going to move to Hebrews. We won't get far today, but we're going to move over to Hebrews. I'm excited to get into Hebrews, actually. Today's message is all about, by himself purged our sins. Maybe you can read that, maybe you can't. But it's Hebrews 1.3. So we're going to get into Hebrews and talk about that. But before we do, you know, there's a specific learning outcome that we want to talk about every week. And the, spe the specific learning outcome today, hopefully, you can know where you're going when you die. That you can write a simple sentence that you're going to have and you know where you're going. Why? Because you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and resurrected for you. You should know where you're not going. You should know you're not going to hell. 
Why? Because Christ paid for all of your sins. You believe that. That would be the specific learning outcome of every lesson we have, that you understand the basis of that because that foundation drives everything. That foundation will drive how you approach everything else in life. If you're not understanding of the gospel, if you're not understanding of eternal life, your service will constantly be messed up because you will think service is for salvation and that is not accurate. So hopefully today you can understand that you know, you can write a simple sentence explaining where you're going and where you're not going. Why? Because you believe what Christ did for you. Some of the things we cover every week, and if you're online, you don't get to see some of the stuff. We, we have a pretty nice slideshow. But you know, the, you know the, rea the reality is that we've all sinned. And we like to compare ourselves every week, you know, or somebody to our neighbors down the road. And, you know, me, Herman and I go to the jail on Monday nights, and our society definitely likes to care, compare ourselves to the men and women in jail or in prison. But instead of comparing ourselves to the man down the road, our neighbor, the drunk, we need to compare ourselves to God. And when you compare yourself to God, we've all missed the mark of perfection. For all of sin that comes short of God's glory. And if you understand that, because we've all missed that mark, we're none of us are perfect. And then we need to understand that the wages of sin is death. Payment for sin is death. Now, if you want to reject what Jesus Christ did for you, there's no water baptism, no asking Jesus into your heart, no turning from sin, no becoming a church that will ever save you. Because your one lie that you're told, all of us have told the one lie. The one lie requires a death payment. So either you believe he did it for you, or you go to hell and you pay for it all eternity because you never make a perfect sacrifice. Wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heaven's a perfect place. Revelations 21, 27. Only perfection is allowed in heaven. That's why Christ died, because he gives us his perfection. He came from heaven and he gives us his perfection so we can go there. That's the gift. You can't earn it. See, God won't be indebted to anybody. If you could earn it, that means God would be indebted to you. He'd be like, okay, I owe it, but he's not going to be indebted to nobody. But he'll give it to you. He loved you. You will not be indebted to nobody, but he'd give it to you by grace. None of us deserve it, but he says, you know what, I'll give it to you if you believe what I did for you. And that's a great verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not my faithfulness. Faith is the arm that holds the object. And I tell you, my faith is in Christ alone. You can't earn it. Christ died for our sins. That's a fact. Christ died. It divided history. Now we have a you see, in this time, in this day and age, we have a constant attack on Christ. We have, they want to change B.C. and A.D. Now, B.C. was before Christ, A.D. is after died. We live in a time now where they want to call it before common era or after common era. So they want to change that. But Christ divided time. Divided time. Christ died, that's history. He paid for every man's sins. The question is, do you believe he did it for you? Because that's salvation. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He gives us his righteousness. Christ died for all our sins. Colossians 2.13 says, Forgiven you all trespasses. How? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrast, and at the bottom there, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That's a beautiful verse. To be saved, saving faith is only to believe. Saving faith. Everybody walked in this building here today is demonstrating faith. You sat in that chair, you sat in that chair, trusting that chair would not collapse you. That's faith. And all you need is faith of his mustard seed that you would believe that Christ is going to save you to heaven. You believe he died for your dead of sins. That's it. Only believe it. It's simple, yet can be complex for adults. Children get it. That's why we need to understand we need to preach it to kids it's adults that we've been calloused, we learn to not trust, we've been betrayed. And so it's hard for us as adults to be like, okay, you know, but yeah, you need to learn to trust because it's the only way. Believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. Now Calvinists will tell you that God predetermines some people to heaven and he predetermines some people to hell. That's called Calvinism. That is not accurate. 
God says the chosen are in Christ. You choose if you want to be the chosen or not. It's an open invitation to anybody. You know, <laughs> Hebrews 2.9 says, by the grace of God, he tasted death for all men. Man, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, not go to hell, but have everlasting life. That is the good news. Truthfully, truthfully, I, tell, I speak unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You can know you have it right now. Have. Have everlasting life. The second you believe, you have it. That's the promise he proclaims. In hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. What people don't need to understand is the gospel is everlasting. It just wasn't just when Christ died that we received eternal life is what the promise has always been. It was declared before creation was created. And that you can know you have eternal life. Man, these things I've written on you believe in the name of the Son of God. I was thinking about Jesus' name. Why can you talk about Buddha and Hinduism and Allah and nobody gets offended? But the second you talk about Jesus, people get offended. It's because of his name. I've thought about his name and his name means Yahshua is salvation. and Christ means anointed one. His name proclaims who he is. His name proclaims you're a sinner and he is the savior. Yahshua is salvation. That's why the world rejects him, hates him. And that's the name that we're trusting in. Yahshua is salvation. He is the savior of the world. He is my savior. I'm trusting him to save me to heaven when I die. And actually I know I'm going to heaven because I got eternal life right now. These things are written on you. Believe on the name of the son of God that you may know you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Good stuff. Good stuff. That's the seven points of peace. If you turn over to Hebrews, I encourage you to grab your Bible out. Try not to beat the microphone on the desk. It's annoying. So it's going to be page 1318. 1318. Follow along. The authorship of the book of Hebrews is unknown. You know, we, we just got done with the book of James. You know, James wrote that. The debate of James was a James half brother, was it one of the apostles? Don't really know, but we know Paul signed a lot of his letters when he wrote to Timothy and Thessalonians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. You know, some speculate it was Paul, because in, in Hebrews 13 it talks about how he uh, hopes that Paul would come or Timothy would come visit them. I think it's uh, Yeah, it's the last verse, the last three verses in Hebrews 13. It says, Know you that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. And we know Timothy traveled with Paul going around sharing the gospel. And uh, so maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's Paul, but we don't know. The Lord is silent on that, so we'll be silent on that. But we know the one and true author of the book of Hebrews is the Holy Ghost. And I love this, for, this, this verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So Moses didn't sit on a rock and ponder and then write the first five books. Matter of fact, Moses wrote the books in 1445. He wrote the first five books called the Torah. If you know the Jews, they read, they read the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses wrote that around 1445. Well, how did he know about Adam and Eve? How did he know that Cain killed Abel? Well, God revealed that to him. The Holy Spirit wrote through him. Man didn't just write this up. The Lord wrote through these. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's why we have a book, a Bible, that's you know, written from over 1,500 years. Moses, 1445 B.C., the Apostle John, John the Revelator, wrote a Revelations in 95 AD. So you have over 1,500 years, 66 different books, 40 different authors, 
and not one contradiction. Not one. The only error that you'll find in the English Bible is transliteration, where man has made the error from translating the Hebrew to English or the Greek to English. But there are no, there is no mistake in God's word. He's infallible. He's without mistake. His words are true, and they never change. He is immutable. So the date of the book of Hebrews is important to know, because Hebrews, it was Christians that were going to the temple and offering animal sacrifices again. So after Christ had died, there was a group of Christians that got back into offering animal sacrifices again. And we know the temple was still there, but we know also the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Rome. I think General uh, Titus had destroyed the temple. So the purpose of the book is that the law was fulfilled when Christ died. He fulfilled that. He fulfilled the law. And with Christ's death payment for burial and resurrection, there was no need for animal sacrifices anymore. They were pointed to the cross at Calvary. They were pointing to the Savior. And now he fulfilled it all. There was no need to go back to that. Matter of fact, if they did, it was bringing an open shame back to the cross. It was bringing an open shame to Christ. And you're going to see that in Hebrews 6. The believers were lapping, lapsing on their back under an animal sacrifice, which is not trusting in Christ alone. So they were mixing faith plus works for salvation. We see in religions doing that today. And that's not salvation. And I would say that's probably why the Lord destroyed the temple in 70 AD. We know the Romans did it, but I would say the Lord probably had a hand in that, saying no. And the temple one day will be rebuilt. We know it will be. We know that Satan will come. Satan's going to enter a man. He's going to have all the answers. There's a satanic superman that's going to come on the scene. We don't know who he is. We don't know if he's alive today. He has not entered man yet. But, you know, one day he is. We know the Holy Spirit will be removed. I believe that's when the church is raptured. The Holy Spirit is removed from the earth. And the man's going to come on the scene. Satan will enter a man, and he will have all the answers to the world. See, you know, I believe that the short, this gas shortage... This food shortage, this uh, uh, you know, fertilizer shortage, is all planned. And, we're, and again, I believe Satan has a hand in that. And then he's going to come on scene and have all the answers. And then he'll sign a treaty with Israel. Israel is the epicenter of the world. If you know anything what's happening, it all comes back to Israel. The oil, everything, the two-state Palestinian solution, Everything. The thing that happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation, he's going to sign a treaty with them. He's going to violate that treaty and he will sit in the temple three and a half years in, 1,260 days, three and a half years, and he will declare that he's God and he will be worshipped for three and a half years. And they will move on Israel and there will be a huge battle. Those are things that are going to happen. If you're saved, we're not going to see that. But the temple is going to be rebuilt at some point in time. And uh, will it be rebuilt before we hit the rapture? I don't know. But they're actually talking about it right now, rebuilding the temple. They have the high priest, the Sanhedrin there already. They have the seven, they have five red heifers that they brought in from Texas just this year. So the high priest can wash themselves, sanctify themselves with the red heifer. They have offered up an animal sacrifice already. They're trained, they're, they're uh, training Levitical priests right now to do all of those things and what they did in the temple. So things are moving along pretty quickly. But you know what? The book of Hebrews for us is that Jesus is better. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is all about. Jesus is better. And then you're going to read about the angels. We, we you know, when somebody dies, I see, you know, often people say, well, he received his wings today. That's not accurate. We don't turn into angels, but there seems to be an angelic worship around the world today. But I tell you, we're going to find out that Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the words of the angel. Christ is better than man because he's going to give us the example of Moses and Aaron and Joshua Christ is better than the high priest. We know that uh, Kevin talked about the high priest. 
They would have to go on the Day of Atonement. Once a year, they could go into the Holy of Holies. They would have the temple built, and ultimately they would go in the sanctuary daily for the, for the, the bread and the offering of the incense and uh, the, the oil. But only once a year, the high priest could go in the Holy of Holies, and he would take blood for himself and for the people, and he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And see, there was a veil there. Well, when Christ died, Hebrews tells us in the book of Hebrews that Christ's body was that veil and he tore it down and he gives us access to the Father. He breaks down that barrier. The veil was 30 feet high, they say five inches thick, and they had an earthquake and it ripped from top to bottom. When Christ died on the cross for sins, that happened when he said, it's finished. It's incredible. Yet people want to deny this kind of stuff. So he's better than a high priest. He, he, and we're going to read that there. He's after the order of Melchizedek. We're going to study where that came from in Genesis chapter 14. He's better than Joshua. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the Old Testament covenant. So many people want to trust in that Old Testament covenant. They want to trust in their good deeds. He's better than that. He's better than the earthly tabernacle. The one that they had built, Solomon built. He's better than that. Matter of fact, he built the one that's in heaven. Christ's blood is better than animal blood. Because animal blood, we're going to find out, never paid for sin. Christ's death is better than others. Christ is better, is a better sacrifice. And Christ's covenant is far better. Christ's blood is far better, for it offers an everlasting covenant. So Christ is better. Here's some interesting facts. I just want to see my next slide here. The word better is used 12 times in the book of Hebrews. One, it shows the superiority, superiority of Jesus Christ and his salvation over religion. It shows his superiority over religion. Look what it says here, Hebrews 1.4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name by they. Hebrews 7, 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope, by the which we draw near unto God. Then Hebrews 8, 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by now much also he is mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises, the promise of eternal life. Another word that's repeated in the book of Hebrews is perfect. Perfect. The word perfect is used 12 times, just like we just read better in the book of Hebrews. Perfect, the word perfect means perfect, complete, to accomplish. As we read already, Hebrews 7, 9 had the word better, but also has the word better, has the word perfect. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did he, by which we draw near to God. We know that the blood of animals cannot make anybody perfect. We read that right here. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, the animal sacrifices pointing to Christ, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comes thereunto perfect. It is only Jesus Christ that can give perfection. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Another word in the Hebrews that's repeated is eternal. Eternal. We know the word it is written is five times, but also the word forever is often used in Hebrews. This is an incredible verse right here. Hebrews 5, 9. Christ is the author of eternal salvation. And being made perfect, he came, became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Trust him. Believe him. Through his death, he obtained <laughs> eternal redemption. Neither by the blood of bulls, blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
He shares with us his brothers. He's not embarrassed to call us his brothers, the one that have come to Christ. He shares with us his eternal inheritance. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. His throne is forever. Hebrews 1.8 says, But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He is a priest forever. Hebrews 5, 6, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And probably one of my favorites in the Bible, I love John 10, 28-30, but this is a good one too. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is, gives us encouragement. We can have, he doesn't change. We can know what, the, what he promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, that same promises as to us. This is why the gospel of Christ and the eternal life is so important. Why do we always share the gospel here? You might be able to read that. But if you have the Bible in front of you, I would ask that you could just pull it up in your Bible. And you can read it yourself. It's 2 Peter, it's page 1339. 1339. 2 Peter 1, verse 9 through 12. And I highlighted a few words here. Forgotten, always in remembrance. So 9 through 12 says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Remember he, Hebrews 1, 3? He himself purged our sins. Wherefore, the, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Verse 15 says... Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decree to have these things always in remembrance. So one, remembering who we are, sinners, who he is, Savior, how I'm born again and become adopted in his family. I have an old nature and I have a new nature. Like Kevin said, we have a battle, that old nature, new nature. Am I going to feed the old nature today? Or am I going to feed the new nature today? When you read and grow in the knowledge of Christ, you, free, you feed the new nature. Nobody ever loses their salvation. Now you can earn rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You never lose rewards because your rewards are stored in heaven. But you know what? You will be sure of what you could have had also. So again, that's what we're always talking about. Learning to grow up in Christ. Learning to live by faith. First get saved if you're not saved, but then learn to live by faith. Be not a double-minded man and be like, okay, God will do it. No, he won't. Yes, he will. No, he won't. But you don't live by faith, knowing that he's got your six. He's got your back. He will take care of you. And when your time's up, no matter what you do, your time's up. But until then, enjoy what you have. Take the time to share the gospel with others. Make sure your kids and grandkids are saved. Be kind to you know, the people around you. So the reason we always share the gospel of Christ at the church here is that we'll forget if we don't. We, can, we need constant remembrance of who we are and who Christ is for salvation. We're sinners. We, deserve, we are deserving of hell. Christ loved us. He gave his life for us. He died for our debt of sin. His resurrection is proof. Whole chapter dedicated to that. 1 Corinthians 15. The second we believe he did this, we receive eternal life. And it's important that we understand eternal life because our destiny changes. Our eternal destiny changes the second we believe. That's power. Going to hell, then to heaven, the second I believe what he did for me. 
So I would say, now that I'm a child of God, it is reasonable, reasonable for me to serve the one who redeemed me. I don't do it to stay saved, to keep being saved. I do it so others can know. I want others to know that they can know they're going to heaven. So we constantly remember because mankind will mess it up if we don't constantly remind the truth. I'm gonna, yesterday I called a man and I just want to have a little conversation here what had happened. He said you had to make Jesus Lord of your life to be saved. <laughs> I wanted to call and have a discussion with him. But when individuals say you got to make Jesus Lord of your life, what are they really saying? They're saying that you've got to follow the commandments to be saved. What they're really saying is that your life must show that you're saved, which is lordship salvation. Now, lordship salvation is something we need to be wary of. Lordship salvation does these things, and they'll see the word they, and I'll use believers for we. But Lord salvation, lordship salvation is this. They do things to be saved. They'll make Jesus Lord of their life, They'll turn from sin to be saved. They'll say things like, pick up your cross. They do things to say, stay saved. And then they do things to prove that they are saved. They do things because they like to be fruit inspectors. They walk around with a magnifying glass inspecting people's lives and then pick it apart and make themselves look good. That's a Pharisee. And the Lord re re reminded of us of Pharisees to beware of the Pharisees. That's legalizers. That's self-righteous. We need to be cautious of this. And there's a difference between the ones we believe. There's a difference between us and Lordship Salvation. Because we, believers in Christ alone, we do not do these things to be saved. The second we believe what happened there, we're saved. We're saved. I'm in Christ's hands. So I don't share the gospel to, to get saved, to be kind to others. I don't do those things, come to church. No, I am already saved. We do not do these things to stay saved. We don't do these things because I'm, I want to be compassionate or read the Bible, or come to church to stay saved. No, I'm already saved. I do those things so others can see my faith. I want to represent my Father in Heaven with honor and integrity. I want to be a good steward. I want to be a good ambassador. I don't want to be like Afghanistan where we would just abandon our embassy and be like, and not be a good ambassador. We do not do these things to stay saved. We don't do these things to prove we are saved, like invite others to church, clean the church, give money. We don't do that. If you never give a dollar again, doesn't mean you're saved or not. What matters is if this, if you trust in that. So we do these things so others can see our faith and they can know they have eternal life. And that's why the gospel needs to be shared. Because it is through my works, people can see where my faith is. A man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me that faith without my works and I will show thee my faith by my works. See, there's a difference. Lordship salvation trusts in their works to save themselves. They are motivated to try and save themselves. And they do this by comparing themselves to others. The believer is resting in the finality of Christ's work. We're motivated to try and save others. Motivated to win and save, to win the saved, and motivated to win the lost. So as I went further with this conversation with this individual, he said, he told me, I'll discuss anything with you except eternal life. That's what he said. And I thought about that a lot yesterday. A lot. The true test of the gospel is eternal life, and eternal life is not the gospel. But let's look at this. This is the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also they received it, they believed it, and wherein you stand. It's a foundation. It's where it's clearly something we are standing on. We rest in that. 
by which you are saved. Paul's telling the Corinthians that they are saved. He's reminding them what they had already believed in. The Corinthian church had a lot of problems. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached on you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the test is this. The test is to ask the person these questions. Can you lose your salvation? Is there any sin that you could commit after you're saved that you could lose it? Now, if a person says they can lose their salvation, they do not understand the gospel. Because he paid for all sins. See, after a person is saved, they can never, ever lose their salvation. Why? Because he paid for all sin. If a person says there is a sin that can, you can make you lose your salvation, like suicide, I hear it all the time, we're in the jail, suicide comes up, and they'll say, you know, if you commit suicide, you can lose your salvation. They do not understand the gospel. Because Christ paid for all sin. And the second you believe that, your sins are all paid for, past, present, and future. Because all of our sins were future at Calvary at the point. It's important that we understand that. People talk about suicide, and you know what? Samson committed suicide. Samson is in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Samson had, you know, he had a gift. When I was a kid, I wanted to be like Samson. Samson. I loved to eat honey, and I wanted to kill a lion with my bare hands. And I did. I just wanted, as I could see myself doing that, I lifted weights and wanted to be just like Samson. But Samson, had found, what, I, what I found out probably happened to me, too. Samson was trusting in his own strength and to come back to hurt him. See, the, Christ, the Christian victory life is not living a, a Christ-independent life. It's learning to live a Christ-dependent life. And Samson, he thought he was wise, and he had fallen in love with the Philistine women. And he, you know, he was not allowed to tell them about his strength was in his hair. And we know that Delilah, she was angry with him. And he says, oh, if you, if you tie me up with seven bands of the reeds from the, the Nile River, you know, then, you, then I'll have no strength, whatever it was, something like that. He fell asleep and she tied him up and he woke up and he's like, Psh. it's like, what is this? And she gets mad at him. And it's like, man, Samson, you should, if she's trying to, to trick you, you should have been, you know, you should have been uh, one step ahead of her. But she was like, you know, Samson was playing, che Samson was playing checkers. <laughs> Delilah was playing chess. She was many moves ahead of him. But at the end of the day, Samson went and told her that his strength was in his hair. She cut it off. They burned out his eyes. And he sat at a grinding wheel the rest of his life, just like if you ever watched the movie Conan, the man on a grinding wheel, pushing this big stone that went in a circle. But Samson got himself, they would bring him, the Philistines would have these carnivals, and they would have these, you know, the lions would come out and eat people, whatever. When they brought Samson out, they were going to make fun of him. I think it was a boy that was holding on to Samson, and Samson's like, put me between the pillars. And he put him between the pillars there, and he pushed the pillars, and I think there were 6,000 Philistines on top of him. Ultimately, that collapsed and fell upon him. Samson committed suicide. I don't recommend anybody taking their life because God can honor your life in any situation you're in. Again, it's learning to live by faith. But there's consequences to sin. And Samson, reading the story, if you want to read Judges, it's the, it's, I think it's like in Judges chapter 16 on. It's a great story. You can learn a lot from Samson. But we can't lose our salvation, not even if we take our own life. Why? Because Christ paid for all sin. Now I'm going to ask you a question. And this, is a, this is an important question. Because if eternal security is not true, you need to think about this. If, eternal, if we don't receive eternal life the second we believe, then nothing, nothing happens. This, this piece of scripture, this doctrinal truth, has to be true. But I'm going to give you some examples here 
If, a sec if eternal security is not true, we're all still lost. None of us can get to heaven if, if the free gift of salvation is not received the second you believe. If eternal security is not true, we are hopeless, hell-bound sinners. See, it has to be a gift. If eternal security is not true, Christ is not who he claims to be. Because Christ said, it is finished. If eternal security is not true, Christ is not our Redeemer. See, a Redeemer is someone who pays the penalty in full and, and buys back the person. See, we were, we were kidnapped by sin, and Christ paid the ransom in full at Calvary. He is our Redeemer. If, Christ, if eternal security is not true, Christ is not our Savior. See, a Savior is someone who brings a person all the way home to be saved. Saved from danger, hell. Christ saves us from how we deserve to heaven. We don't save from danger. If eternal security is not true, then the Bible's a lie. Eternal life is mentioned 30 times in the Bible. Everlasting life mentioned 70 times. God promises eternal life. If eternal security is not true, heaven is out of reach and out of bounds. If eternal security is not true, it's not of grace. If it's not of grace, that means it's of works. And it's a debt that none of us can pay. See, eternal security is of grace. If eternal security is not true, Satan wins. If eternal security is not true, there is no redemption. If eternal security is not true, Christ dying on the cross was a waste of time. See, either a person is saved the second they believe or they're never saved. Eternal security has to happen at conception. At the point that that baby was conceived between mom and dad, that baby came a life conceived in the womb. The second, and we didn't see it for nine months, but God knew that thing was alive in there, that baby was alive in there. It's the same for us. The second we believe it's conception, our life might not show it, but we're saved because it happened at the point of conception. What good is eternal life if we don't receive it right away? If you don't receive it right away when you, don't, when you do get it? I should say this. If you don't receive it right away, when do you get it? When you die? How do you know? No. The Bible tells us we get it right there, the second we believe. See, if eternal security is not true, nobody's in heaven. If eternal security is not true, there's no justification, sanctification, or glorification. There's no judgment seat of Christ. There's no marriage supper of the Lamb. There's no forever reigning with Christ. See, this and this. If eternal security is not true, there's no gospel. Now let me explain. For the gospel to be true, eternal security has to be true. Think about that. Let me ask you this question here. The gospel that Christ, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins and was buried and resurrected. True? Yes? Yes. See, if not, if that's not the gospel, the person does not get eternal life when they believe. But the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, resurrected. True? Yes. We get eternal life when we believe. If we don't agree on the gospel of Christ, we don't agree on eternal life, what else is there to talk about? Because really, that is the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for grace living. It's the foundation for the two natures. It's the foundation for rewards. It's the foundation for serving with him in the kingdom to come. It's the foundation that we are raptured. It's the foundation that we don't go through the tribulation. Everything hinges on the gospel of Jesus Christ and eternal life. The gospel of Jesus Christ and knowing you have eternal life is the foundation we build upon. It really is. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. And that was a conversation that I had with a gentleman yesterday. He said he wanted it. I didn't finish the conversation. 
But he said, I'll talk to you anything about eternal except eternal life. And I said, well, eternal life is the foundation. When you understand the gospel, you know you have it because Christ paid for all sin. And then he hung up on me. We need to pray for him. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3. I'll read 1 through 3 and we're going to come back to 1. God, who at sundry times in the diverse manners spoke in times past in the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That is so good. So God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spoke in times past to the, to the fathers by the prophets. So whoever wrote this is telling us right here, God, you know, in the Greek, he's Theos. God, the supreme and sovereign deity the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, God. At sun-dry times, which means many times, spoke and passed unto the fathers by the prophets. Spoke, you know, we know Joshua, the, when, we, you know, when the angel of the Lord came upon him. But we know the, the prophets of the Old Testament. Enoch, Genesis chapter 5. We all want to talk about Genesis chapter 6, about the, the ark going into the flood. And I believe the ark is a picture of, there's going to be a small remnant of believers, Jewish believers, that are going to go through the tribulation. I believe that's because Enoch was raptured. Genesis chapter 5, Enoch never died. And I believe Enoch is a picture of us, the church, going up. We're not going to go through that tribulation. And I believe the ark... Noah's Ark is a remnant, is a picture of the tribulation period. There's going to be a small remnant that's going to be delivered through that tribulation. So Enoch, he was a prophet. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David. And then we have the ones that are named in the Bible. You know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. We know John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet on the New Testament pages. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he had made the worlds. However, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his Son. We are living in privileged times. His Son is far better than the prophets. Better than Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Better than Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel. The prophets were given by given a message by God to share with mankind. Now God himself in this flesh speaks his message to us. And he says things like this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And 3.5, he says, you know, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. We're all born with a flesh birth, but we need a new birth, a spiritual birth, a birth that's from above. Not of man's will, but God's will. A spirit we receive, a new nature. The flesh is our old nature, it's our sin, but we get a new nature. That's what separates and goes on to heaven forever. He tells us in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, he tells the Pharisees, for in them you think you have eternal life. There are they which testify of me. He says, the scriptures speak of himself. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. 39, this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he gave me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. John 10, 28 says, And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. A double negative in the Greek means that will never, ever, 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 ever perish. Never, ever, ever go to hell. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Look at John eleven twenty five, 25, what Jesus says. This is an incredible verse. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? We will never die. Never die. He tells us that a corn, we all have planted a garden. The next time you plant your garden, think about Christ being buried. When you bury that seed of corn, what does it do? That corn had to bring life through its death. And Jesus tells us there in John 12, 23 through 24, and Jesus answered and saying, the hours come, the Son of Man should be glorified. Why? Because he's going to die, be buried, and he's going to go, just like we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the work is done, and he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it beginneth forth. Christ being that dead seed for us. Bury a seed, it brings forth life. Christ buried, it brings eternal life for us. And Jesus said here in John 19.30, to tell us die, it's an interesting word in the Greek. It is finished, is a past tense, present tense, future tense word. It means it has been finished, it is finished, and will ever be forever finished. In John 20, 31, he tells us, you know, this is why he's the better prophet, because, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Yahshua is salvation, the anointed one. Yahshua, Jesus, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, one, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. He tells us in Revelations 22, you can look it up if you have a red letter Bible, and these are his words, and behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. Reward at the judgment seat of Christ. We receive rewards if we're faithful children of his. We don't do it for salvation. After we're saved, that's service. To give every man according to his work shall be, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and everything in between. It's all about Jesus. When he comes, it will come quick. Boom. Like the twinkling of an eye, the rapture. Be like, there will be like, hey, Jesus is coming, see you later. No, it will be like, you're gone. An heir receives a lot of possession of his right. That's what Hebrews 1, 2 said. So it was said there that we are heirs. Heir of all things, he is heirs of all. He hath appointed heir of all things. So when the parents die, the kids sit around and read a will and see what they inherited. An heir receives the inheritance. Are there individuals who can't wait for their parents to die so they can receive an inheritance? I heard a story just this week that a man died in Arizona. The ambulance had not even come, uh, come yet. And the children were stepping over the body, taking things from the house. We should respect our parents in life and death. Christ is the heir because he is the Son of God. He receives the allotted possession by his right, being the Son of God. He is the heir that shares his eternal inheritance with us. Now that's a brother that I love. He is my big brother. In verse 2, it also tells us that Christ made the world, the ages. He made the unbroken age of eternity. He made this world and all of the universe. He's not limited by time. He is perpetuity, which is continued uninterrupted existence. He is the Jesus I am. He's the ever-present, ever-existing God. Verse 3. Whoops. Skipped a verse. Anyways, Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and I. This is the God we worship. See Christ in the brightness of his glory, which is perfectly shining forth the majesty of God. He is the express image. He is the exact expressage exact expression, image. He's the exact copy of the Father. He and the Father are one. Christ is God, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. He says, it's finished. He purged our sins. 
the work for sin is done. He sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. He purged our sins. And what did you think about this? I was talking to a man about a science one day, and he, guy, he says, you know, man's invented science. I'm like, no, I don't think so. God has given man science. See, he upholds things by his word, his power. See, there's, there, there's these natural laws of God, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these natural laws of God. There are universal laws of God, like the laws of gravitation. We know what happens if I would drop, it would, it would drop. It's consistent. Every day I wake up, there's gravity. We know that I personally don't like gravity because it is because of gravity that my back is bad, not because of poor choices. No, right, yeah. Can blame it on gravity, but you know, gravity pulls on our body all the time. Another universal law states that every object moves in a straight line unless acted upon by force. These are truths. You know it. You can leave your car, you get out of your car, and you leave it in reverse, and psh, you know, that thing's going to keep going until it runs into the garage, right? Yes. Another universal law states that an object is directly proportional to the net force exerted and inversely proportional to the object's mass. If I was to push this little remote, it moves. But if I go out there and give that same, you know, that car doesn't quite move. Another universal law states that for every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. Now, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. This is the movies with shooting guns. A guy will be holding a shotgun, and he shoots somebody, and the guy flies off the chair. If that actually happened, the guy that actually pulled the trigger would fly off the chair too. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when you pull the trigger of a gun, you feel that. That's what the object feels. They feel that. These are universal truths. But do we know why these universal laws exist? Natural law exists because the universe has a creator, a God who's logical and has imposed order on his universe. He's upheld it by his word. Universal laws are created by God. They undergird. Now an undergird is not the foundation. The undergird is below the foundation. They undergird the foundation, the fabric of all creation. They are upheld by his word. God's universe is governed by perfect universal laws accomplishing his plan. And I'll give you an example. Who created the earth and the heaven? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it, it existed. Look at this one. He stretched out the north over the empty place and hanged the earth upon nothing. Job is written in the oldest book in the Bible. He spoke and he hangs on earth upon nothing. You ever see those pictures of, from the moon? Look at earth. There's nothing. He takes this globe and he hangs it in midair. Empty space. Telling Job that. The earth and all the universal laws of gravitation are upheld by his word. We know the earth is in the orbital because of the sun's gravitation. Isaiah 40, 22 tells us this. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to, what, to dwell in. He speaks of the earth as a sphere 700 years before Christ came. In 1492, Christ sailed the ocean blue. They would not sail because they thought the earth was flat. They were going to fall off. 700 years before Christ comes, we know it is a sphere. Now we say these things, natural laws exist because the universe has a creator, God who's logical. But there are spiritual laws. The battery's going dead, I guess. Not only are there natural laws, but there are spiritual laws because we have a God who's logical and he is God of order for salvation and service. Man's a sinner. Sin deserves a death payment. Man deserves to die physically and spiritually two deaths, eternally separated from God. God loves mankind. God loves you. He died for your debt of sin. He paid for your sin in full. Spiritual truth. 
He purged your sins at Calvary. He was buried and he was resurrected from the grave. He freely gives you eternal life. The second you believe. All upheld by his word. The application I would say that we have for today Is there a truth to proclaim? Yeah. Christ died for all sin. Is there a promise to proclaim? Yes. You can know you have eternal life. Is there an error to mark in our thinking? Yes. We need to be constantly reminded of who we are and who he is so we don't forget. Now, if you're not saved, if you've not seen this before, or just ask that everybody would look up here for just a second. This hand here represents you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. God loves us, hates our sin. Now, if you're sitting there today, you can put your name on it. For God's love, Lance. For God's love, Joe. But we're all sinners. We missed the mark. Sin separates us from God. But here's the good news. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past, revealed himself in the flesh, and he went to the cross. He took all of your sin. He died, and he rose right in the third day, showing your payment for sins paid in full. And if you'd believe that, he gives you his righteousness put to your account. So I'd ask that everybody just close their eyes for a second here. If you just bow your heads, close your eyes. In the quietness of your mind, you can have a conversation with God. Nobody does the saving. Christ does the saving. If you're saved, I'll just ask that you pray, pray for others right now to receive Jesus as their Savior. If you're trusting in something else, maybe you walked into church today, maybe you're watching online and you thought you were good, you were good to go to heaven. You can change your mind right now. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm going to ask you a question. What's stopping you from doing it right now? What do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So in the quietness of your mind, you can talk to God right now. You could say something like this. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was buried and resurrected for me. I believe he did that for me. If you did that right now, why don't you just, why don't you tell your Father in heaven, thank you. Tell Jesus, thank you. Because you were just adopted into his family. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're just so grateful that you love the sinners just the way we are. And we're just grateful for the words of life, that we can read, our life, read it for ourselves, that we can understand what the gospel is, we can know we're saved, eternally saved, and never lose that. We know that is the foundation. We don't need to go back and get re-saved. We're once saved, always saved. That's how we can grow in grace. We can understand the two natures. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for the faithful people that can continue to come out and support it. And we pray, Father, that you could use this message that people would come to Christ by faith. But also that people would understand the importance of the gospel, the importance of eternal life. That we would be constant and re reminded of these things. And Father, to your children here, maybe somebody just got saved. We just want them to know that they're always welcome to come out. If they have questions, they can give me a call or email. It's always confidential. But we're so grateful for everybody here. Father, bring us back next week where we can continue to give glory to you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song. Jesus loves even me.